Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation, our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org <laughs> website on all of these occasions. I would ask our guests in-house to make that courtesy check that your cell phones have been silenced as we prepare to begin. Even the speaker. Yes, sir. <laughs> Powerful up here. Uh, our internet viewers are, of course, reminded that they can send questions or comments throughout the presentation or at any time to speaker at heritage.org. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. Welcoming our special guest today and opening our program is a gentleman at Heritage who needs no introduction. Edwin Meese, of course, serves as the Ronald Reagan Fellow Emeritus here at Heritage, and he was the 75th Attorney General of the United States. Please join in welcoming him. Thank you, John. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to join John in welcoming you to the Joseph Story Lecture. Joseph Story, as many of you know, was uh, born in 1779, uh, shortly after uh, the, dec the Declaration of Independence, actually. And uh, he had quite a career uh, even before he became a justice of the Supreme Court. He was elected to the state legislature in 1805 at a relatively early age, served a part of a term in the United States House of Representatives, then went back to the, House, uh, uh, to the Massachusetts legislature and was chosen its speaker. And it was from that position in uh, November of 1811 that President James Madison appointed him at the age of only 32, being the youngest justice of the court at that time, <clears throat> and even though he had no judicial experience per se, uh, he was appointed to the Supreme Court. He served on the court for 33 years, uh, from 1811 until his death in, in 1845. And in addition to serving on the court for the last half of his tenure there, uh, he was moonlighting as a law professor at Harvard University. He's best known, as many of you I'm sure are aware, for his magisterial Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States, which was first published in 1833. Uh, it, this work has been described as the cornerstone of early American jurisprudence, and it remains today as a critical source of historical information about the forming of the American Republic, and particularly the early struggles that define the law and the development of law in this nation. Joseph Story was a champion of originalist thought and interpretation uh, for the, of the Constitution, uh, and a great example of faithfulness to the actual word of the Constitution, act, what, uh, believing that the Constitution should be interpreted as it actually reads, and that the words of the Constitution mean something. And it's for these reasons that the Heritage Foundation and our Center for Legal and Judicial Studies uh, has adopted the name of Joseph Story for our highest legal award. It's presented uh, to a distinguished judge, law professor, or member of the legal profession who is noted for his or her excellence, dedication to the cause of justice, and fidelity to the Constitution. And that's certainly the case of our distinguished judge and guest this evening. Uh, Carlos Bea was, is, is, as I know a number of you know, uh, I won't say the distinguished judge, but he's certainly uh, one of the distinguished judges, of which there are a few, precious few, on the Ninth Circuit <laughs> <laughs> of the United States Court of Appeals. Uh, he was appointed to the court by President George W. Bush in uh, 2003. Uh, actually, uh, just Judge Bayo was uh, born in San Sebastian, Spain, immigrated with his family in 1939 to Cuba, and uh, then came later on to study at Stanford University, where he received both his BA degree uh, in 1956 and his law degree in 1958. Uh, actually, I uh, completed both in the space of, of just six years. It's my understand also, and he can confirm this, that he actually represented Cuba as a member of the country's basketball team in the Helsinki uh, Olympics in 1952. I believe that's correct. Uh, so he is distinguished both as an athlete, uh, then as a judge, uh, and as a judge, he also he started in private practice in California after his uh, graduation from Stanford. Uh, he then became, uh, again, a, a trial judge uh, 
in the San Francisco Superior Court, and then uh, was nominated to the, to the Ninth Circuit, as I mentioned, and uh, had the distinction of being confirmed by the United States Senate uh, by a, a, a unanimous vote of 86 to 0. Again, something that doesn't happen every day, particularly these days. Just, uh, Judge Bayo has uh, had a distinguished career on the court, but he's also been a great uh, exponent of the law, of, uh, of the cause of justice, and has distinguished himself also as a speaker and as a, a great practitioner of the law and uh, has been very much interested in the profession as a whole. And so he has served in bar association work. He's been very active in the Federalist Society. And he's a, a distinguished judge, but also a person dedicated to the advancement of jurisprudence and our legal system. It's a pleasure for me to introduce tonight's Joseph Story lecturer, Judge Carlos Bale. Thank you, Ed, uh, for such a generous introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, a moment before I start, I met Ed Meese in 1958. He was a member of the Bolt Hall moot court team, and I was a member of the Stanford moot court team, and we met in the final moot court exercise of the State Bar of California. Um, He's been very generous over the years. Uh, we sort of have a gentleman's agreement. He doesn't mention that Cal beat Stanford that night. And I don't mention that he was representing a labor union. <laughs> this afternoon, I want to talk about statutory interpretation. I chose this topic because the interpretation of statutes is so often decisive of cases of natural, national importance in which cases touch all our lives. Specifically, I want to talk with you about how courts are relinquishing the power to interpret Congress's statutes through deference to executive agency interpretations. This undermines our system of separation of powers. It tends to decrease the powers of Congress and of the judiciary while vesting more power in the executive and its many administrative subsidiaries. This trend toward abandonment of judicial statutory interpretation gained a solid foothold about 30 years ago in the often cited Chevron case. I believe the trend was worsened by the Supreme Court's opinion last term in King versus Burwell, the decision in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act case. That is a case where the Supreme Court held that although Congress passed a statute which limited tax credits to taxpayers who bought health insurance policies through a, quote, exchange established by a state, unquote, Congress really meant and, quote, exchange established by a state or by the federal government, unquote. I do not intend to address the political consequences of that decision or to speculate what would have happened had the court come out the other way. Instead, my focus is on how the majority's decision to ignore the basic rules for reading a statute had potential, has potentially opened the floodgates for further aggrandizement of power in the executive branch. A word about our separation of power system. Justice Joseph Story recognized the genius of our system of separation of powers in his famous commentaries on the Constitution. He wrote, every government must include within its scope, at least if it is to possess suitability and energy, the exercise of three great powers upon which all governments are supposed to rest, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial power. In absolute government, Story explained, the whole executive, legislative, and judicial powers are at least in their final result 
exclusively confined to a single individual, and such a form of government is denominated a despotism, as the whole sovereignty of the state is vested in him. Relying on Montesquieu, Blackstone, and the authors of the Federalist Papers, Justice Story recounted, it has been deemed a maxim of vital importance that these powers should forever be kept separate and distinct. And Chief Justice Marshall famously declared in Marbury versus Madison, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. I now turn to Congress's role in the presentment clause. The power to interpret statutes affects the balance of the separation of powers. Again, Justice Story explained the importance of the judiciary's independence in interpreting statutes. Where there is no judicial department to interpret, pronounce, and execute the law, to decide controversies, and to enforce rights, the government must either perish by its own imbecility, or the other departments of government must usurp powers for the purpose of commanding obedience to the destruction of liberty. The presentment clause in Article I of the Constitution reads, Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it became a law, become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. In other words, the bill contains the words upon which the House and Senate vote. And these words become law only if the House and Senate agree to them and the President does not veto the passed bill absent a two-thirds majority override of the veto. This is crucial. The legislator's collective intention or plans and individual legislators' various reasons for approving the bill are not the law. Those intentions and reasons are not agreed to by a majority of both houses and the president. As Justice Scalia said, we are governed by laws, not by the intentions of legislators. Let's consider Chevron and the deference it demands. The most well-known and accepted manner in which there is a breakdown in the founders' careful separation of powers occurs when federal courts give deference to executive agencies' interpretations of Congress's statutes. This is called Chevron deference, after the Supreme Court case that announced the standard for deferring to federal agencies, Chevron USA Incorporated versus Natural Resources Defense Council Incorporated, 1984 case. Chevron tells us that when a court reviews an agency's construction of the statute which it administers, the court must answer two questions. First, applying the traditional tools of statutory interpretation, the court must determine whether Congress has directly spoken to the precise question at issue. If the language of the statute is unambiguous, that is the end of the inquiry. For the court, as well as the agency, must give effect to the unambiguously expressed intention of Congress. But if the, state is, if the statute is silent or ambiguous with respect to the specific issue, the question for the court is whether the agency's answer is based on a permissible construction of the statute. If the agency's construction is a reasonable interpretation of the statute, then the agency's interpretation is valid and will be afforded deference by the court. Again, the basic rule of Chevron deference is that if a statute is ambiguous, the federal agency charged with implementing the statute can issue regulations, interpreting it to mean whatever the agency wants within the bounds of that ambiguity. I suggest that federal courts abdicate their duty to interpret statutes when they apply Chevron deference. This failure to interpret statutes undermines the separation of powers in two ways. First, it permits the executive branch through its agencies to make laws. An agency need only look for an ambiguity in a statute, and it can issue regulations that eliminate that ambiguity. In most instances, this permits an agency to make significant policy choices that the founders left to Congress. And the agency's regulations 
have the same force as a statute passed by Congress, yet they were not enacted by Congress. Second, Chevron does not end at permitting agencies to exercise legislative power. It also opens the door for agencies to exercise judicial power, taking the power to interpret a statute away from the judiciary. As Justice Thomas recently noted, Chevron precludes judges from exercising that judgment, forcing them to abandon what they believe is the best reading of an ambiguous statute in favor of an agency's construction. It thus wrests from courts the ultimate interpretive authority to say what the law is and hands it over to the executive branch. We now come to King versus Burwell. Under Chevron, an agency is permitted to interpret the law only if the statute Congress passes is ambiguous. And as the Supreme Court tells us, we must apply the traditional tools of statutory construction to determine whether the statute is ambiguous. By traditional tools, I mean those canons of law of how to read words that have been used by courts for centuries, some of which are still sometimes referred to in their Latin forms. For example, if possible, every word and every provision is to be given effect. Verbum cum effectu sunt accipienda. A word or phrase is presumed to bear the same meaning throughout the text. And if there is a conflict between a general provision and a specific provision, the specific provision prevails, generalia specialibus non derogant. You may think the tools of statutory construction will show the statutes are rarely ambiguous, and as a result, there is little worry that agencies will be given too much power to make the law. But I suggest that you would be wrong. That brings me to King versus Burwell's challenge to the Affordable Care Act, ACA, or Obamacare. Recall that ACA had three major components. First, the act requires insurers to provide the same rates for health insurance to everyone, regardless of each person's actual health risks. Second, the act requires almost everyone to purchase health insurance. This theoretically prevents people from waiting until they are sick to sign up for insurance, at which point the insurer would have to insure the sick person. Third, the act provides subsidies to those living close to the poverty line to purchase health insurance. Of particular relevance here, the act authorizes the IRS to give a tax credit if the taxpayer is enrolled in an insurance plan through, quote, an exchange established by a state, unquote. If a state chooses not to establish its own exchange, the act provides the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall establish and operate such ex exchange within the state. 34 states chose not to establish their own exchanges. And as a result, the federal government established and ran exchanges in those states. Congress delegated to the agency, here the IRS, the task of deciding who was entitled to a tax credit to help purchase health insurance. The IRS found the language authorizing tax credits for insurance plans purchased through an exchange established by the state to be ambiguous. So it issued a regulation that authorized tax credits for health insurance policies purchased through federal exchanges as well as those purchased through state exchanges. The plaintiffs in King challenged that regulation, arguing that the statute by its own terms permits tax credits to be issued only for plans purchased through an exchange established by the state. Their state, Virginia, had no state exchange, only a federal exchange. If the King plaintiffs were right, the unavail unavailability of tax credits to those low-income plaintiffs would excuse them from the requirement of the individual mandate. They would not have to buy health insurance at all. The Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit agreed with the executive branch that the phrase established by the state was ambiguous 
and the IRS's rule was within the reasonable bounds of that ambiguity. Under Chevron deference, then, the IRS could provide subsidies to individuals who purchased health insurance on federal exchanges. The Supreme Court took the case and affirmed the Fourth Circuit, with Chief Justice Roberts writing the opinion on behalf of the six justices in the majority. The issue as framed by the majority appeared to be clear. Quote, whether a federal exchange is established by the state. It strains our language to think that the answer to that question is anything but no, because a state is defined in the act as one of the, quote, 50 states and the District of Columbia, unquote. Indeed, in perhaps the understatement of the year, the majority admitted that the, quote, most natural reading, unquote, <laughs> of the phrase established by the state is that subsidies are available only for insurance plans purchased on an exchange actually established by a state. <laughs> but the majority did not stop its analysis there. It should have. Instead, the majority found that when read in context of the statutory scheme, the clarity of, quote, established by the state, unquote, somehow became obscured. The context referred to was that if established by the state meant what it said, then tax credits, then, then the tax credits to individuals would be unavailable in the 34 states that chose not to establish their own exchanges. Mind you, this context was created not by looking at the act when it was enacted, but by using hindsight as to how 34 states had in fact reacted to the act. Because the court's majority found that this would cause the insurance markets in those states to enter a, quote, death spiral, and that this could not have been, quote, Congress's plan, unquote, the majority found that it was, quote, possible that established by the state had more than one meeting. The majority found Congress had a plan to achieve universal health care coverage. The best way to implement that universal coverage would be to interpret the phrase an exchange established by the state as ambiguous. According to the majority, quote, the phrase may be limited to its reach, in its reach to state exchanges. But it is also possible that the phrase refers to all exchanges, both state and federal, at least for purposes of tax credits, unquote. Though the majority found the phrase established by the state to be ambiguous, it did not defer to the IRS's interpretation of that phrase under Chevron deference for reasons I will explain later. Instead, the majority took it upon itself to interpret the phase established by the state. To do so, rather than get down to the work of applying the traditional tools of statutory construction and interpretation, that is, doing the traditional work of judges, the majority sought to achieve what it conceived was the overarching purpose of Congress's plan, universal coverage. It proceeded to do so on the unspoken premise that Congress couldn't possibly have guessed wrong as to whether its incentives to the states to create exchanges would in fact succeed. And if Congress did guess wrong, it was the court's duty to straighten things out in the manner that the executive wanted rather than to allow Congress to fix the act. This is akin to concluding which of two stocks, A or B, an investor purchased by looking to which has since had the greatest rise in value? <laughs> of course we can assume the investor wanted to maximize his investment, just as Congress wanted to maximize health coverage. But wouldn't the more valid approach be simply to look at the investor's order slip to see what it said? Here, the majority in King used its assumption that Congress wanted to maximize the number of enrollees in Obamacare 
and couldn't possibly have made the erroneous prediction as to how the states could react. I suggest this is not statutory interpretation, but post hoc rationalization. To determine the meaning of the statute, the court should have started and ended as we did with the investor's order slip, in other words, the words that Congress wrote. So according to the majority, despite the words that Congress used, what Congress really meant was that subsidies were available for insurance plans purchased both on a state exchange and a federal exchange because it would be implausible, that's the word, to think Congress intended the death spiral to ruin insurance markets. But is it implausible that Congress guessed wrong on what it would take to motivate the states to create exchanges? Had Congress guessed right about what incentives the states would need to set up exchanges, then states would have created exchanges and there would have been no death spiral. I submit it is not for us, the judiciary, to fix a statute that is clear in its language just because Congress's predictions of how the statute would operate turned out to be inaccurate. I move on to the principal dissent. Justice Scalia's dissent rebuts the majority's failure to apply the traditional rules of statutory interpretation and its ultimate conclusion that established by the state could mean established by the state and federal government. Justice Scalia starts with a cardinal tool of statutory interpretation follow the plain meaning of the words Congress used. The plain meaning of established by the state is, of course, established by the state. Therefore, that phrase cannot mean established by the state and federal government. Justice Scalia then turned to another traditional tool, the structure of the statute, which he explained as a, quote, tool for the understanding the terms of the law, not an excuse for rewriting them. Unquote. In that regard, Justice Scalia noted that the statute sharply distinguishes between state exchanges and federal exchanges. He found it curious that the court is willing to subordinate the express words of the section that grants tax credits to the mere implications of other provisions with only tangential connections to tax credits. Even if the majority was correct that these provisions would make little sense if no tax credits were available on federal exchanges, it would show only oddity, not ambiguity. Courts do not revise legislation just because the text as written creates an apparent anomaly. Federal courts have no free-floating power to rescue Congress from its drafting errors. The judiciary's task is to apply the text, not to improve upon it. Justice Scalia then turned to yet another common interpretive tool, the need to give effect, if possible, to every clause and word of a statute. Under the Act, there are only two types of exchanges, federal and state. By interpreting established by the state to mean both federal and state exchanges, the court read out entirely the limiting clause, quote, by the state, unquote. This violates the principle that all words in a statute be given meaning. Moreover, Justice Scalia points to the statute's varying use of the term exchange in isolation and exchange established by the state. The justice notes, it is common sense that any speaker who says exchange some of the time, but exchange established by the state the rest of the time, probably means something different by the contrast. Finally, any ambiguity in the word state is eradicated by the statute's explicit definition of the word state to include each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia. The majority brushes this ana analysis off, explaining that the rule against superfluous words is, quote, not absolute, unquote, and conclusively states, quote, rigorous application of the canon does not seem a particularly useful guide to a fair construction of the statute, unquote. The majority doesn't tell us why an application of the canon would be unfair, much less cause an inaccuracy in interpretation. The cases the majority cites 
in support of this limp application of the canon are of no help in figuring out when we are to apply the canon rigorously. You get the picture. I submit the majority was wrong. The phrase established by the state is not at all ambiguous, and the structure of the statute confirms rather than undermines the natural reading of the phrase. Now on to how the majority's interpretation in King undermines the separation of powers. As I discussed at the outset, the Constitution tells Congress that it must exercise its legislative power through the presentment clause. Both houses of Congress must agree on the statute's language, but both houses do not have to agree on what the intent of the bill is. Senators and representatives can and do have different views of, on how a statute will operate in practice. In King, the majority ignored the words Congress used and instead divined its own version of what must have been the, quote, plan, unquote, of Congress. However, the plan actually stated in the plain language of the statute was to have the states set up exchanges so that their citizens could get tax credits. In my view, even though King did not apply Chevron deference, the majority's opinion does not limit Chevron's applicability. To the contrary, the majority's effort to find an ambiguity in the, statutes, in the statutory text where none existed and the majority's failure to apply the traditional tools of statutory interpretation undermines our separation of powers. This opens the floodgates for judicial deference to agency actions under Chevron. If the Supreme Court can find, quote, established by the state, unquote, to be ambiguous, then almost every statute is ambiguous and subject to, be, to being interpreted, not by its words, but by the court's notion of what was Congress's plan devised in hindsight. And the court's reason for not applying Chevron's deferences are not a significant limiting principle. The court explained, in, quote, extraordinary cases, unquote, the federal courts should not defer to the agency. King was one of such cases because, first, the tax credits presented a question of, quote, deep economic and political significance, unquote, since they involved billions of dollars in and affect health insurance prices for millions of people nationwide. And secondly, the IRS had no particular expertise in crafting health insurance policy, so its interpretation should not be given any deference. But just what constitutes a question of, quote, deep economic and political significance? In the past, the court has rarely held an issue to be a major question where de Chevron deference is not applicable. Indeed, the King majority cited only two cases a case which did not give Chevron deference to a law which was interpreted to make tobacco a drug under the Federal Drug Act, and another in which the EPA interpretation would have resulted in, quote, unprecedented expansion of EPA authority that would have a profound effect on virtually every sector of the economy and touch every household in the land, unquote. This portentous language is not any sort of a true limiting principle as to what statutory interpretations will be left to executive agencies. The second reason is even less convincing. Sure, the IRS had no expertise in crafting health insurance policy, but the issue in this lawsuit was whether plaintiffs were eligible for tax credits, and that was squarely within the IRS bailiwick. Therefore, by combining Chevron deference to executive agencies and King's post hoc rationalization as a new rule of statutory interpretation, under which almost any statute can be found ambiguous, we will continue down the path to erasing our separation of powers and consolidating legislative and judicial powers in the executive. This is dangerous. Lest you think the possibility is purely theoretical, I am sorry to report the courts are already relying on King's mode of statutory interpretation to find plain statutes to be ambiguous and then using that contrived ambiguity to defer to an executive agency's interpretation of the statutes. Just recently, the Second Circuit applied King 
in just this way. At issue was Dodd-Frank's protection, which provides employers cannot retaliate against whistleblowers. The Dodd-Frank statute defines a whistleblower as someone who reports wrongdoing to the commission, meaning the Securities Exchange Commission. Yet the Second Circuit extended whistleblower protection to an employee who reported wrongdoing only to his firm and not to the Securities Exchange Commission. The majority used King to find an ambiguity based on its interpretation of Congress's plan. It found it was unlikely that Congress failed to provide whistleblower protection for those who report Sarbanes-Oxley violations internally, despite the clear statutory text of the contrary. The Second Circuit majority then deferred under Chevron to the SEC's rule interpreting whistleblower protection to extend to those who report wrongdoing only internally. In other words, the court abdicated its role to interpret the clear words that Congress wrote and allowed the agency to define the contrived ambiguity and what it should mean. Indeed, some judges are so eager to interpret a statute to conform to what they think, quote, must have been, unquote, Congress's plan, that they use Congress's plan that they have discerned to interpret statutes even where they have found the words are not ambiguous. This happened this month in a Ninth Circuit bankruptcy case, where even though the majority explicitly found the statute not to be ambiguous, it's still engaged in post hoc rationalization of what Congress's plan must have been to support its conclusion. Now I'd like to discuss some ideas about restoring the role of the judiciary by cutting back Chevron's applicability. If we have to live with Chevron, let's redefine the standard for ambiguity. For starters, it is far too easy for judges today to find a statute ambiguous. Under the current standard used by most courts, an ambiguity exists when a statute is capable of being understood by reasonable persons as having two or more different meanings. For example, in King, the Chief Justice found it, quote, possible that the phrase established by the state refers to all exchanges, both federal and state. This means that courts are quick to accept a party's claim or assertion of ambiguity and quick to invoke the Chevron deference. Of course, we should not discount the all too human inclination, present even in judges, to let someone else do the work. <laughs> it is much easier to find a possible ambiguity and pass the buck to the agency to interpret the statute than to do the work of applying the traditional tools of statutory interpretation. In my view, a statute is not ambiguous just because two reasonable people could disagree about its meaning. A statute is ambiguous only when it has two meanings that are equally probable. In a seemingly oft forgotten footnote in Chevron, Justice Stevens declared that a court must employ, quote, the traditional tools of statutory construction to ascertain a statute's meaning. Thus, to determine whether a statute is ambiguous, the court should labor with these traditional tools of interpretation to determine the most probable meaning of a statute. If a court employ, employing these tools discerns a statute's natural meaning, that statute should not be found ambiguous. The question may well be asked, how will judges determine which meaning is more probable? There are many traditional tools of statutory interpretation. Some point one way, some the other. Some may not even be applicable. But judges are accustomed to weighing factors embedded in rules to determine outcomes. Every day, judges across the country weigh competing factors to make just such determinations as whether to grant a preliminary injunction or determine whether a trademark has been infringed. Weighing the relevance and effect of the traditional tools of statutory interpretation to determine what is the more probable meaning of a word or phrase involves the same weighing of sometimes complementary 
sometimes contradictory considerations. It is what we judges do. This is the core of the judicial role, interpreting the most likely meaning of a statute based on the words that Congress wrote. I would suggest that if courts were to employ this standard of ambiguity, it would restrict Chevron deference to agencies in all but the most extraordinary circumstances. However, I have an additional suggestion. I think we should reconsider all the assumptions underlying Chevron deference and consider Chevron's abandonment altogether. In other words, let's junk Chevron. In the Chevron opinion, Justice Stevens claimed that the court had long recognized that considerable weight should be accorded to an executive department's construction of a statutory scheme it is entrusted to administer. Justice Stevens justified deferring to the EPA's understanding of the statute regarding pollutants because a full understanding of the force of the statutory policy in the given situation has depended upon more than ordinary knowledge respecting the matters subjected to agency regulation. That is, judges have only ordinary knowledge, while agencies' administrators have expertise. To me, this reasoning smacks of the early 20th century Wilsonian progressivism notion that modern life has become too complicated restrict adherence to our separation of powers, and that we need experts and administrators to guide our lives through government. President Woodrow Wilson thought our separation of powers to be, quote, inefficient, unquote, and believed that the administration of our government should be placed in the hands of these politically disinterested experts and administrators. In his study of administration, then Professor Wilson wrote of the distinction between constitutional and administrative questions. Quote, the field of administration is a field of business. It is removed from the hurry and strife of politics. It at most points apart, stands apart from even the debatable ground of constitutional study. Perhaps President Wilson's faith in the prowess of experts might have been tempered by the rollout of the healthcare.gov website for insurance. <laughs> In particular, Wilson knew that the progressive conception of administration could not fit within the constitutional separation of powers. Wilson forthrightly admitted in his study that our whole conception of administration, his whole conception of administration was foreign. Indeed, it was based on the Prussian bureaucratic state champion in Hegel's philosophy of right. As I mentioned, Justice Stevens thought that these so-called experts were needed to interpret statutes in areas outside the ordinary knowledge of the courts. This justification for agency deference rests on the premise that in highly complex and technical areas of regulation, agencies will have more expertise on the subject matter of the statute than the court. So agencies are better suited to make policy choices in interpreting the statute. And because many agencies work closely with Congress in drafting the statutes the agency is interpreting, they are better suited, the argument goes, to interpret the words that Congress wrote. But this defense of agency deference misunderstands the relevant question and highlights one of the core problems with Chevron deference. It converts a question of statutory interpretation into one of policy making. The question that must be answered when interpreting a statute is not what is the best policy choice, what would be the best policy choice in the statutory scheme, but what the statute as presented means. Additionally, we must remember that it is the text of the statute that has the force of law, not the legislator's unexpressed intent. If anyone is to have traditional expertise in this area, it is judges, not some administrator from EPA or IRS. Although administrators may have more expertise than the judiciary in the substantive area 
they are regulating when it comes to interpreting statutory texts. Our founding philosophy comes from Alexander Hamilton, quote, the interpretation of the laws is the proper and peculiar province of the courts, unquote. Another justification for agency deference is the notion that executive agencies are more politically accountable than Article III judges, and thus agencies should be the ones interpreting ambiguities in con congressional acts when such interpretation calls for public policy judgments. But the Constitution meant Article III judges not to be politically accountable. We are the one of the three branches that does not stand for election. And this insulation means we should, not, we should not abdicate our role to say what the law is. Furthermore, even assuming that Congress may delegate its own legislative power to the executive, it has no constitutional authority to delegate judicial power, of which it has none. It is one thing for Congress to set up, to delegate to an agency the decision of how many offices to set up and where to set them up. It is quite another to delegate to the agency the power to interpret the words Congress used in the statute. Article three of the Constitution vests, quote, the judicial power of the United States, unquote, in the federal courts, not Congress. Part of this power, the power to interpret texts, has since the founding been traditionally vested in the judiciary. It extends to, quote, all cases in law and equity, unquote. That means cases where the statute is claimed to be ambiguous as well as where it is clear. Congress cannot delegate a power which it does not have and which the Constitution vests in a co-equal branch of government. Lastly, the Wilsonian progressivism idea that administrators will selflessly reflect good government policies runs aground on more recent studies in public choice theory. Public choice studies show that politicians and administrators usually act with their own self-interest in mind instead of the public's interest. They seek to maximize their utilization. Thus, agencies are more likely than the courts to interpret the statute, not as Congress wrote it, but to add to their importance and power. In Chevron itself, the Supreme Court noted that the EPA under the Carter administration had proposed a definition of stationary source and justified that definition as, quote, more consistent with congressional intent because it would bring more sources or modifications for review. Of course, the more sources or modifications there are to review, the more EPA inspections will occur and the more power will accrue to the EPA. As the courts permit administrators to have leeway in crafting policy and interpreting statutes, it is only natural those administrators will continue to push the limits of their power and expand their regulatory state. Just last term, Justice Thomas recognized how aggressive administrators have become because of the deference that courts have given the executive to interpret and apply congressional statutes. After the Supreme Court struck down an EPA regulation that imposed 9.6 billion a year in costs on power plants for a relatively measly 4.4 to 6 million in benefits, Justice Thomas noted that we should be alarmed that the EPA felt sufficiently emboldened by our Chevron precedents to make the bid for deference that it did here. We should be wary of the potential havoc King and Chevron can wreak on our separation of powers when applied together. To me, King has the potential to break down any true barrier between Congress, the executive, and the judiciary. Justice Story was right, of course. The consolidation of those powers in a single body is akin to an absolute government. We seem headed down that path. King's reasoning authorizes the federal courts to find just about any statute to be ambiguous, and Chevron commands that agency be given deference to fill those ambiguities. As a result, the executive, legislative, and judicial powers are combined in the same entity, the executive. If we as judges do not re-engage our role in interpreting statutes,
we may be left with the tyranny that Blackstone, Montesquieu, the authors of the Federalist Papers and Justice Story himself warned us about. For the sake of preserving the separation of powers that Justice Story so valued, I hope we see a shift back in the correct direction soon. But if not, King V. Burwell is just another step toward another king our founders sought to escape. Thank you very much. Judge Bea is to be commended that nobody will have to interpret what he said in his, <laughs> his remarks. The, the meaning is pretty clear to me, at least. <laughs> the judge has indicated he'll answer a few questions. So uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, this is our, our opportunity. We have time for uh, just a couple. Yes. Eli? I mean, no. There you go. Um, judge Bea, uh, Andrew Grossman. Um, my, my question is, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, Chevron was championed by conservatives um, as um, helping to deal with the problem of um, judicial uh, overreach and judicial supremacy. Um, I, I guess, what is your response to, to, the, to the idea put forward that, you know, in, in some decades in the past, we have seen a judicial overreaching where the judiciary has um, interpreted ambiguities in statutes in ways that, um, you know, could be said to, to, to represent uh, policy making perhaps more than a plain legal interpretation. I don't accept the premise that conservatives are always right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> secondly, secondly, there's a big difference between an administrator interpreting a statute and a judge interpreting a statute. An administrator re determines the, 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 interprets the statute in a regulation and goes home to McLean that night. A judge has to explain his interpretation, and that explanation can be criticized, it can be turned around, it can be overruled, it can be vacated. And that, I think, is the difference. Uh, I know that certain justices were in favor of Chevron historically. Um, let's see if they stay that way. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Hi, uh, Andrew Kloster here with the Heritage Foundation. Um, so my question is what happens when, um, one, one of the features of Chevron is that an administration, an, an agency can make an interpretation of a statute and then the administration changes and they can change the interpretation too. Some people describe that as a feature rather than a bug because it kind of greases, greases the wheels, I guess. I was wondering if you could comment on that and how that also impacts separation. Well, I think that that's a very good point. Uh, and and it's, it's a very great danger. It was uh, shown in the, uh, in the Chevron case itself. Why should regulators be able to change interpretations of statute without a vote of Congress? It, 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 that doesn't square in my mind as to uh, who should exercise the legislative power. Yes, sir. Oh. Go ahead, John. Um, even in the instance when the uh, Chevron Step 1 produces uh, an ambigu ambiguity in your year terms or equally plausible mm -hmm. things, w would you suggest even then we ought not to defer to the agencies but send it back to Congress? An intermediate court should apply Chevron until Chevron is abandoned by the Supreme Court. An intermediate court can limit the exercise of Chevron by adopting a more difficult to meet standard as to ambiguity. That's why I said, first of all, how can we limit Chevron if we have to live with it? The Ninth Circuit, contrary to what many of you might believe, actually 
is subservient to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> Until Chevron is re-examined on all the bases that I've suggested and others, we have to live with it. Yes, sir. This is the last one. Could you uh, uh, discuss whether it's possible to suggest that when you have complete ambiguity, you also do not have an intelligible principle and thus could invalidate a statute? Yes, I, I accept your, your, your idea. The, uh, I was told once in, in a, uh, uh, in a, in a, actually it was a pub in, uh, <laughs> in Oxford by a British barrister. The problem with you Americans is that you overinterpret your statutes. If a statute is not understandable to the man in the high street, we don't enforce it. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with saying this statute is so unintelligible that it cannot be enforced or applied. Right. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate your remarks, and I am pleased to present uh, a few mementos here. Uh, first of all, we have the Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States in two volumes, which are awfully good for exercises in the morning as well, <laughs> as, well as for reading. Thank you. But if you want a smaller and easier uh, volume to carry, uh, this is the Familiar Exposition of the Constitution of the United States by Joseph Story. It does have a foreword uh, by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. And, and I, uh, but most important, and that is the, the highest legal award that we present at Heritage Foundation, and that is the Defender of the Constitution Award, which as I think everybody will agree from tonight's speech here, you certainly deserve. Here we go. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we uh, invite you uh, to meet the judge and to meet each other at a little reception outside in the foyer of uh, Allison Hall here. Thank you. <laughs>